Hello, my name is James Bonhoff and for my engineering design and management implementation video presentation I'll be talking about compressive members or compression members. If you can please send your reviews to james.bonhoff at cqmail.com. I'll also have this um, in the description under my YouTube video and at the end of the presentation. So what are compression members? Compression members can be defined as structural elements that are subject to axial compressive forces. So another definition is the load is applied to the longitudinal axis through the centroid of the cross section. So that means any vertical forces coming down, you've got your column which might be cylinder, might be other shapes, but the, the load is applied vertically, you've got the longitudinal axis, the centroid is the middle, and your cross-sectional area. So the load is shared between the centroid and the cross-sectional area. Day-to-day -day usage compression members can be called um, your columns and posts. In cranes you may describe them as booms, in trusses you may describe them as trusses. Most of the time they're used in conjunction with beams. Columns have been used widely throughout history and that can be seen in the Acropolis as well as uh, structures like the Stonehenge and any of your historic buildings. If you've travelled through Europe, you'll see many of them. So your materials. Now a variety of materials can be used throughout one project. The use of materials will depend on your cost, uh, the environment as well as what is it being used for, so your loads. Um, in relation to aluminium and fiberglass, they're both low cost, very versatile, um, durable, workable, but the downside to them is that they are minimum load bearing. Your concrete with a steel frame, uh, you'll see this used in much of the larger structures. So your bridges, um, your, I guess your traffic and transportation will use them to support roadways and, um, and train lines etc. Stone, stone is used widely in in-ground improvement and foundations. Um, and in your historical columns and then you have steel so most of my research centered around steel as this was readily available and highly discussed in journals so your steel is a, has a very high compressive strength it both yields and deflects before it fails it's quickly it's quickly assembled but it can rust and it is expensive um, the Sydney Harbour Bridge has permanent workers on there sandblasting taking the rust off, reinforcing and then repainting. So over time the steel um, can lead to um, higher workloads. In relation to wood, um, wood can be seen as beneficial but uh, the compressive forces are normally um, perpendicular to the grain. But you'll see a lot of wood uh, posts and columns used within uh, small housing. So your applications. Thanks to gravity, um, any structure that needs support from vertical forces um, will use compressive members. And like I said, bridges, in-ground earth stabilisation, your residential, your cranes and your oil rigs, the list goes on. Um, but compressive members, anything that opposes a vertical force. So your technical information, uh, some of the jargon or terminology used in relation to your compression um, members. You have your moment of inertia, your parallel axis theorem, the radius of gyration, um, that can be used to describe the distribution of the cross-sectional area in a column around its centroidal axis. Then you have your effective length. Um, I'll talk about the length in the next slide. You have your slenderness ratio, uh, you have principal axes, critical loads, and factored compressive strengths. Now, the slenderness ratio um, that relates to the strength of the material, and because of steel being such a highly having such a high strength, it can um, it can be a slender column. Steel often higher strength, therefore a safer design. So in that top right there, I have a few different um, designs of the steel columns. You have your H or I beams 
you've got your hollow rectangle or circular sections. Now simply to test the stress of a column um, you use the Young's modulus of compression which is the force applied over the area in square meters and the picture in the middle there is of your short compression members so ductile materials will bloat and sometimes they crumble under failure and then you have your brittle materials which will just um, they'll have a sheer force or a sheer crack through them if failing but your shorter beams or your shorter columns will be uh, your stronger so other considerations for design um, the length of your beam or your, the length of your column sorry um, so your shorter your shorter columns are limited by their material strength so obviously concrete steel and wood having different uh, material strengths and then your intermediate columns are bound by the inelastic limit of the member I'll discuss that on the next slide as well as the long um, columns are bounded by the elastic limit and that's talked about in Euler's formula so to classify the lengths, both slenderness ratio and your material properties need to be considered. So the slenderness ratio takes um, the effective length into consideration. Now the effective length has boundary conditions and those boundary conditions are related to like your hinge fitting, um, it being a free column, it being a guided or it being um, clamped or fixed. So the buckling, um, Euler's formula uh, can be considered for simply supported columns um, under an external load. So in the formula there, you've got um, the F being the external axial load, and that E is being Young's modulus for the column material, and I being the area of moment of inertia, and the length being the length of the column. Now this just gives a prediction on when and how or just really when, under what load, um, a column may fail. So in your long compressive members, the failing will look like a buckling, as seen in the picture there in the top right. And then in your intermediate uh, compression members, you'll see annealing, so your inelastic buckling. And the extended Euler's formula um, just pretty much describes the critical buckling load that a column can be um, applied to. So your footings, now I discussed the boundary conditions just before, but you've got your hinge, your free, your guided and your clamps. So there's many types of footings and fixtures and that can be seen in, your, in the picture there. You have standard corner half, in-ground bases, etc and most of the footings today are reinforced concrete footings so they might have u-bolts etc um, molded into the concrete there's also calculations to determine the footing placement and the areas needed for the footings strong footing will allow for a safer uh, structure so your Australian standards um, looking into steel you have AS4100 on page 74, section 6, the members subjects to axial compression. Now, admittedly, this is, went over my head, but um, the research in here is, is a great reference for the analysis on definitions and formulas. So some of the formulas I discussed earlier are discussed in far more complexity than what I described in this presentation. So for any uh, steel columns, uh, that is your reference there. So in conclusion, on a day-to-day -day basis, compressive members may be discussed as columns and posts. In bridges and trusses, they may be described as truss, um, as struts, and in cranes, they may be booms. So the structural elements subject to compressive forces, the load is applied through the longitudinal axis, variety of application as discussed, and your stress and strength of materials are a, a high contributor to um, the buckling and the failures of your beams. And the buckling can be described by Euler's formula, but you also have inelastic um, buckling also. 
So like I said, please send your reviews to james.vonhoff at cqmail.com. For those interested, this is a slide for my references. But other than that, thank you for listening to my presentation.